Another episode of Session Stories. This particular guy, there's a few cool story, things I need to say before I get into the episode. Number one, as I was starting to do interviews, I got multiple emails going, well, you've covered his solos. When are you getting Tony Bruno on? And uh, so I was like, well, I better do that at some point because <laughs> people are ready. Uh, the second thing is I was telling him earlier before we, we hit record, but um, of the so when I started the channel, obviously I was recording solos and then I hand tab, do the guitar tab and sheet music for every single solo or riff I cover. And I give it away for free at sessionsolos.com, And people know that, but what's funny is of the 70, 80, 90 ones I've done, uh, Tony Bruno is the only guy that I've done two of his solos from two different bands. I'm a huge fan, uh, of, oh, of Tony. You. I've copped copied a lot of his licks. Um, I still try to figure half the stuff he did out, um, but anyway, I, I'm so excited to have Tony Bruno joining us today on Session Stories. Tony, how are you, my friend? Thank you so much again for the time. Uh, thank you, John. This is a, an honor for me, considering who's been on your show, but I'm great. I'm uh, really well. Since you emailed me, I've been following, like, I'm like looking at some of the past episodes. I'm like, all right, this is crazy because half the people that I ripped off have been on your show. <laughs> well, <laughs> so shoot that hard. <laughs> well, as Dan Huff says, uh, when I told him that I stole a lot of his licks, he was like, I, you know, add me to the list of per people who steal from each other. And some guy on YouTube was like, guitarists are the biggest thieves. I was like, yes, we are. We steal yeah. from everybody and we put it in a big stew pot and we make it our own thing. Um, tell me For about sure. how did guitar, like tell me where you grew up, how you got into music. When was the first time you picked up a guitar? Let's start at the beginning. Uh, I grew up on Long Island, New York. And um, I mean, I grew up at a time when there was still like a pretty lucrative club scene. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was kind of a benefit. I feel bad for musicians now who don't really have that many avenues to play. But I mean, you could, you know, you could play five nights a week, make a living. And you were playing, you know, with like some pretty serious competition. Like, you know, Twisted Sister was on the on the scene then, uh, Zebra. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Rat Race Choir with Mark Hitt, God rest his soul, was like one of the, my favorite guitar players ever. Uh, and you'd be like, shit, if I'm going to do this, I need to really up my game because, you know, I'm not setting foot on that stage till I'm at least half as good as these bands. So it was good. It was, you know, that, that kind of competition is really healthy for learning how to be, you know, a rounded player. Yeah. Did you, were you always, were you in a musical family? Was it one of those things where, like, how did you just discover guitar? I guess, how, how did that happen for you and music in general? That's that's actually a great question. So my dad, I wasn't really a musical family, but my dad did play like clarinet and upright bass, just dabbled okay. in it. And I just remember being like a like a kid, like a toddler, and we'd be at weddings, and I'd be looking up, and my dad would be sitting in with the band, and I was, and I, I'd just scratch on my head. I'm like, I, it just didn't make sense. But then as I got older, um, it, I realized it, it's funny when you when you're a kid, sometimes things don't resonate. But he had been playing like big band music, you know, in our living room stereo since probably before I was born. Mm. And I just, all of a sudden, just got really immersed in this crazy world of like Artie Shaw and Glenn Miller and all that stuff. And it it just stayed with me. I, I found, like, I still find, I do a lot of orchestration stuff now, and I find that stuff like alien to what guitar players do, you know? Like, we mm. know how to do one thing, like stay in this lane. <laughs> and those guys were like, you know, like in the old school when you were an actor, you had you had to sing, dance, and, yeah. and act all yeah. equally well that's what those big band guys were like you know like the horn player could sit behind the drum kit or behind the piano and it would be no big deal so it kind of stayed with me you know although i was an art student uh, i went for um uh, illustration like my first band started when i was in college and it was like okay uh what's going on here am i going to continue being an, uh, an artist or am i going to hang with these guys and each, obviously which one won yeah. When, where did you go to art school and, and what was the, the name of your first band? I went to, uh, I did a year at New York Tech and then I switched over okay. to uh, School of Visual Arts. Okay, cool. And, and School of Visual Arts, funny, I'm just touring, I just toured this for my son who wants to be a filmmaker. And when you walk in there, it's very hard to stay focused on what you were going in there in the first place because everybody's oh. like, mm -hmm. every, I mean, if you if you read like uh, about, you know, like Pete, like Pete Townsend and, yeah. you know, and like John Lennon, all these people, like every musician was an artist at some point in their life. So it's very easy to fall out of art school and become a musician. <laughs> I uh, get it. I get it because somebody. I, you, what, one of the things before I started this, I started building guitars and I was working on stuff and, and I, I don't have any aspiration, you know, be the next Fender, but it was one of those things where I had worked on enough guitars over 35 something years. And I was like, you know what? I know how I like them to play. 
I'll start making them. But for me, it was the creative outlet of doing the finishing. You know what I mean? So it's the same thing. Right. I could never draw worth a shit. But I was like, you know what? I really like doing a three tone burst and a two tone and, you know, doing a metallic flake and some of the things that I saw. And, and so I get it. I understand the the art thing. So you were in art school and you're like, oh, my God, I'm, I've joined a band. Do I want to continue this? What was that crossroads like? When did you make the decision where it's like, and we're going to music? Um, OK, so I met this guy, John. He was uh, he went to uh he didn't go to sva he went to uh what the hell is it called cw post which is right next to um new york tech in long island so my first year of college i met him and turns out we lived in the same town in farmingdale and you know he looked cool when he was a singer aspiring singer um and we just kept in touch and he started feeding me i was you know back then i was really into just classic rock zeppelin and then boston and all that stuff and like all that you know all the all the great guitar player bands yeah and then he started turning me on to like bands like the tubes and alice cooper Mm -hmm. and he was like really into that stuff and i got so sucked into it i'm like oh my god i didn't even know this music existed and then it was like why don't we start a band you know and then it it jumped from why don't we start a band to dad i'm leaving college (laughs) you know like (laughs) it was like not well received in the bruno household but um but it happened yeah and and it was cool and the first band was called swift kick okay um and we were like we were a huge band on long island it was like we we did we got the biggest break we got was uh d snyder had like had polyps and he had to have surgery i think he had to have surgery i should ask him we're good friends now and and he couldn't uh he couldn't do a full night of music so they were looking for a band to do like two sets and then they would do the last set okay but of course, you know, my band was playing in front of like 40 people and his band was playing in front of 4,000 people. <laughs> yeah. So I, by some, I only because, and I got to give John uh, Pichotta, my old singer, this credit, only because of the tubes and the Alice Cooper stuff we got, and, you know, Twisted Sister, their, their intro, their beginning stuff before they started doing their own songs was very much that. Like mm-hmm. all the obscure, you know, um, David Bowie stuff, you know, like, like, you know, just stuff like that. And uh, they sought us out somebody must have told them hey there's this is band that plays a lot of the kind of stuff that you guys do hmm. and all of a sudden got a call from d snyder and he was like hey man this is d snyder and i almost had a heart attack you know because <laughs> he was untouchable he was yeah. a god you know yeah he's like we want to know if your band will open for us and i'm just like what do you mean you want to know <laughs> like where and when you know we're there <laughs> so that was a, that was a huge thing because all of a sudden we were in front of all these people and um it was great, you know, and, and I think to answer your question, I think that was really when I was like, okay, this is this is it for me, you know, this is this is really the only way I'm going to survive is I can do this forever. What was the transition like? Now that you're in this band, how long did that band last? What was kind of the road for Tony, you know, to to what became this massively successful career? What was the next kind of building block after that band? How long did that band last? All that. After that band, there was a couple of spinoff bands after that, but nothing really, you know, that important. I I just sort of realized that the only way to get into this business the right way was to, okay, first of all, the drinking age changed, like, and that that really kind of put a kibosh on, you know, making money because now you lost all the college kids going to these, you know, sure. to these clubs. Sure. Um, so I was like, okay, now what? So I realized like the next obvious step was to just sort of, you know, roll the dice and move into the city um, and see if I can get in the session world and and hope that that would lead to, you know, other things. And that's kind of what happened. I mean, I started doing, I moved into Queens. I, I mean, I, I, this sounds ridiculous. I think I was paying like $500 a month for a pretty decent apartment. And that seemed like, like a miracle to pay that rent every month. <laughs> but yeah. I managed to do, and I managed to get sessions. And John, this is like how crazy shit was. So this back in those days, there was an amp that was called a Galleon Kruger. Okay, it was like this little, little. I mean, everybody's watching this thing. Well, no, I had one of those. Like it was this little metal thing, but they they kind of cornered the market for like two years. And you could hook up a four by twelve Marshall cabinet to it, and it it would it would sound incredible. Huh. But it had a very specific sound. But it was this big, and it had two speakers in it. Um, as I'm saying this, it just seems so weird where, where, you know, everything's like software driven now, but I would get on the subway. I would walk like eight blocks to the subway if I got a session and literally with my guitar on my back and this, this heavy ass, it was oh, this big, but it was heavy and go to the city and then walk like another eight blocks to whoever's, you know, a studio it was and do this like as much as I could. And then I started getting these sessions with like guys who were writing for Michael Bolton 
and guys who were doing this and that. And then all of a sudden I got a session to play with Michael Bolton. And and that was a funny one because I got in the studio and he was like, what's that thing? I'm like, that's my amp. And, and he's like, you know, the studios that we recorded have amps, right? And I was like, no, but this is my sound, man. This is my sound. <laughs> it was ridiculous. I was like, no, I, I don't know how to play through another amp. This is it. So oh. it, it kind of it kind of led to doing enough sessions where, you know, you start meeting people. Hey, you should come. We're doing a jam here. We're doing a jam there. And then, like, before I knew it, I had, like, met this guy who was doing um, a record with Al Greenwood, the keyboard from Foreigner. Mm. <clears throat> He's like, you should come down there looking for a guitar player. And the singer was Joe Lynn Turner. Yeah. So I don't know if you know Joe, Yo, but like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Joe, Joe always has been and still is crazy, and I he's one of my favorite vocalists <laughs> in the world. I love his voice. But yeah, so I, much. I got the audition. I I got the audition to be with him, and that was like the first real record. Like I was mm. like, oh my god, I'm gonna play on a, a record that's coming out on Electra. Yeah. This is crazy. And then they wanted me in the band, and it was just like all of a sudden I'm now in, you know, I'm in the music business for real. You know, it was crazy. Him and I were soulmates, and we were, we were drinking buddies. I'm not sure which one it was, but we were like, <laughs> we were we were joined at the hip for a couple of years. It was crazy. Right. We had so much fun together. This is my favorite, one of my favorite stories. So we're doing that record, right? Yeah. Myron Grombacker was playing drums um, <laughs> from Pat Benatar's band. And we get into the studio, we're at Right Track, and Joe Ciccarelli's producing it, right? And like, it's funny because like, Joe was not the household name that he is now yeah. at the time. He was still, he was big, but he had just kind of gotten big. So I didn't really know who he was. And I, I have like this photographic memory. So like Myron was playing the wrong kick drum pad of the song. And I'm just, you know, not knowing the protocol. I'm, I'm like, hey, Myron, I think you were playing this uh, in rehearsal. And he's like, bum, bum. and then all of a sudden I hear my headphones, Tony. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, Joe. He's like, can I have a word? So I go in the studio uh, in the control room and he, he kind of like gives me shit. He's, he's like, you know, like uh, I'm the producer of this. He goes, so if you have you know questions about something or think, address the other bammers. And I'm like, okay, I said, I mean, step on your toes. Like, I just kind of remember and you weren't actually at rehearsal. So I, I wouldn't know how you would know this. <laughs> and then afterwards he, he like, I think he felt bad. So he asked me if I wanted to go out, you know, for dinner that night and we got to know each other. And he told me this, and this is one, I, I'll never forget this. We're going back and forth. And I said, so how did you get into producing from being an engineer because i'm actually interested in trying to do that he's like well that's a great story because i, I was the engineer on a muddy waters record wow and muddy was like habitually you know four to ten hours late for a session <laughs> he goes so at one point the producer says you know i've had enough of this and just leaves and i'm just sitting there by myself the engineer and <laughs> muddy waters walks in and he says oh who the producer here <laughs> and he goes uh i am i'm joe chicarelli he goes good produce me some wine I, love it. <laughs> I, was, I was dying. I was, I'm like, oh, okay, that's that one of the best stories I ever heard, dude. Oh, that's so. amazing. What Michael Bolton album were, did you work on? Do you remember? I didn't work on his record. Um, okay. We were doing, we were doing demos oh, for the it. record. Cool. Very but, cool. But um, they never that's made awesome. it on there. But then I ended up touring with him. That's why. The, so I, I mean, here's a it, it, small world question. Because John McCurry did some stuff on Michael Bolton's record and he is in New York. Did you and John McCurry know each other? Well, this is... It, 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 it's the best thing that you brought that up because I was trying to remember John's name before because it was driving me crazy. I'll, I'll, I'll bring, I'll tell you why. But yes, we did eventually know each other. That's very cool. He was the yeah. very first interview that I did for this entire thing. And he was one of my, you know, it, he's one of those, like I tell people, I was of an age where in the 1980s and 1990s, it was like I was the kid listening to the radio. So everything I was soaking up was the soundtrack. And it wasn't that grunge and stuff wasn't important. It was just like, I was so the 60s, 70s and 80s and really early 90s. I was just mining all this music. So when the right. stuff started coming out in the early to mid 90s and it was kind of changing, I was like, y'all can have that. I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure all this stuff out. And so <laughs> there were times, though, that, you know, being in the car, you listen to pop music and there's a long period of time, obviously, that pop music had these killer solos and, you know, really good guitar yeah. work and kind of, and I told John McCurry, I was listening to the, how can we be lover song and my, you know, my mom's car and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden there's this kick-ass solo. I'm like, who's that? You know, and that's one of those reasons that got me into guitar. And so I just wanted to bring yeah. up John McCurry because you said, but Michael Bolton and I'm thinking New York, you guys are both there. Yeah. That's uh that's wild. Well, so the John McCurry thing, it's funny because I was like, so when I worked with Joe, it was the very first time I worked with Desmond Child. Oh, yeah. So 
so Desmond was producing this record, well, a, a few songs on the record. And he's a trip. I mean, he knows exactly what he wants. And he he used to hire John quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and John was one of his guys. Yeah. So when it came time for me to do solos, it, it was very like, you know, like regimented. He's like, the solo has to start on, and it has to have a journey and it has to end on the highest note of the solo. Mm. You can never give away the highest note before the end of the solo. Mm. And, and And I got kind of like, you know, just brainwashed into that. But then I started listening to like some of my favorite guitar players, like you know Keith Scott yeah. uh, from Brian Adams Band, and John McCurry was one of them, and one that we're going to get to on a, a whole other level, uh, which is Tim Pierce, who seems to be everybody's favorite guitar player, yeah. um, according to his master class. But I, I felt like at one point I was the only Tim Pierce fan in the world, like I was the only one who knew who he was, and, and mm. but and then I started listening to his stuff, and I'm like, yeah, this guy's the same thing, man. It's like the, it, that's the mm -hmm. that's the structure of a guitar solo. Mm -hmm. And of course, borrowed some stuff from him left and right. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was that was a big part of like you know how to play a solo that's not going to get erased off the you know off the <laughs> recording. Um, so yeah, the Michael Bolton tour happened. We did like a, uh, like a southeast tour with him, and it was right before. It was actually before the Joel and Turner thing. Oh, okay, um, interesting. Got it. Yeah, it was before that. I just been doing a timeline here. It, it happened in a weird way. Like we knew me and Bruno Ravel knew Bruno played with Michael with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we knew um, cause Bruno and I like grew up together, like Long Island, you know, club guys. So we knew his manager. I'm not sure how we met Lewis Levin, his manager, but we knew him. And Lewis uh, basically said to us, Michael's looking for a band. So I said, I'll put one together. So I put this band together with me, Bruno, Chuck Bonfante, from uh you know from Soraya. Yeah. Uh, Al Petrelli. Yeah. <laughs> and uh and uh keyboard player, I'm gonna remember his name in a minute. And our audition for Michael was the weirdest thing in the world. SIR, the big studio at SIR, playing all of Michael's songs with no vocals, with Michael sitting in a chair in front of us, just just like this. Like just staring at us. I mean, can you imagine? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but good. he loved the band. I mean, we were so we were so diligent in making sure that we, you know, dotted every I and crossed every T. He was just like, okay, uh, we start rehearsals Monday. So wow. we did that tour. And then when that tour ended. And what year would this was, have been, Tony? Like This is probably like 1986, 85 or 86. Got it. Um, and then Bruno had already started planting the seeds for Danger Danger. Him and Steve West were like, you know. Uh, always in bands together. Mm -hmm. They were in a band called Hot Shot together for a while, another Long Island band. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were trying to get demos together, trying to get signed. And I, I kind of wasn't. I um, I was sort of floundering doing sessions. And then I met this woman who, uh, Susan, oh my God, what the heck was the last name? She was the, I can't remember her last name, but she was the queen of the jingle world. Mm. Like she was, uh, she used to work as, as a Hollywood Sessions, it was called, and they did like everything. And I met her at a party and somehow I got invited to start doing sessions. And and I walk into the session room and it's like Elliot Randall. Um, like, I mean, the, uh, Mark Hudson, like, like people who are just legends, you know? Yes. And I'm, I'm like, and I didn't read at all. I do now fairly well. I'm not great, but I didn't read at all. But I had the one thing I had was this crazy ear. Like I could, I could hear stuff once and know it. And the keyboard player um, who wrote all the jingles, uh, I can't remember his name. He would always do this weird thing. He would hide a uh, a Christmas carol in the jingle. Oh wow! In some weird, yeah, in some weird <laughs> abstract form, so that you could probably go back and listen to some of these famous jingles and hear it. Um, That's cool. And I would nail it every time. He'd play through it, and like people would be looking at the chart trying to find it, and he'd play through it. I'm like, oh, Hark to Harold Angel sing right there, bar 44. <laughs> it got to, like, it was this thing where like, the rest of the guys used to be like, like, all right, enough is enough, dude. Like, can you just let us like, grab one? So oh. she came up to me, uh, Susan Hamilton, and she came up to me after the session. She's like, you know, um, we had a singer in here the other day, and she did a jingle for us because not only was she drop dead gorgeous, but she was, like, an incredible singer. Mm. He's like, um, you should link up with her. So it was Sandy Soraya. Mm -hmm. And I called her up and she didn't, you know, she didn't return half my phone calls. And then she finally called me up and she's like, who is this? And I'm like, I get a number from Susan Hamilton, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, I already have a band. I'm like, okay, well, I just, you know, figured to check it out. And then somehow in the middle of it, 
they were doing a demo and the guy who was producing the demos called me up. He's like, Hey, uh, I got your number from Sandy. She said that, you know, you might be interested in doing this because the guitar player we have isn't really working out that well. Mm. And I went down there and like, I played with them and like with the first song we did was a demo of Gypsy Child. That's by the way, that's my favorite song. Keep yeah, going. it was one of my favorite too. That and Saint for Christopher's Metal. Yeah. But I was okay, so I was going through my Steve Stevens phase. <laughs> and uh and it's it, it's great talking to you because you know like we all have phases. Yeah, um 100%. And I kind of I just channeled my 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 Steve Stevens thing into that thing and oh. and basically all that stuff from the demo we ended up lifting and putting on the on the record mm. because I kept when we finally got the deal and we were up up here in Bearsville Studios uh, recording. I just couldn't, you know, that first like weird maniacal attempt at something just has those quirky things in it that you don't know what made them sound that way. But trying to replicate it is definitely impossible. impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they were all like, this is great. you got to be kidding me. I'm like, no, dude, it, I, thank you for saying that. I go, but it's not as good as the demo. So. I said, these are at the same tempo. We're just going to have to fly it in. This is two-inch tape days. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. That was like saying we're going to fly it in was like saying, okay, we we need another machine. And they were like, this is going to cost us a fortune. You know what I mean? We Just because you're stupid so <laughs> But we did it. Um, oh, yeah. I so then that, that ended up being this array of thing. But then what happened was, and I'm kind of speeding this along, but um, just between the connection, danger, danger, when Soraya got the deal... Me and Sandy uh, had written a, a bunch of songs together, and one of them was "Love Is Take Us a Toll," and we mm -hmm. were like, "I'm like, this is this is kind of a hit." Yeah, uh, and it's so funny if you think about that song. Like it, it it's okay. So the, the the title comes from an old foreigner song, uh, "Love Is Taking Us Toll," mm -hmm. which I just loved because it was such an obscure song. Yeah, and uh, and this part the um, is uh, the. <laughs> That part, yes, that's from that's get the let out Aerosmith. <laughs> hey, we guitarists, we'll just borrow something, we mash it together, and it's a new stew, you know. But at least, at least we're honest about it, absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I basically we wrote that, and we both knew it was a hit. The label's like, that's the first single, and everything. And I got offered a publishing deal, um, and I signed a publishing deal and with Warner Chapel, but Sandy and Greg, the keyboard player who had started the band, David Sonnenberg, their manager, owned their publishing. Mm. Like they had signed some kind of a bad deal with him. Mm. And he basically said, well, you know, you got to sign your publishing, 50% of your publishing over to me. And I'm like, hell no. And it was just one of those things where it drove a wedge between us because Sandy and Greg were so pissed that I was retaining my publishing that they fired me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> They like my literally God. fired me from the band. Wow. So I was in Soraya for a minute and then I was out and then... At the time, uh, Danger Danger just got their gig, and Al Petrelli was playing with them. Uh, but I think Al was—I'm not sure if he was already doing the sabotage thing, or whatever. But then they called me up and like, "Hey, man, you know, I don't think Al is going to be able to do this record, and we're not sure if he's the right fit. Can you do it?" So then all of a sudden, I'm in Philly doing Danger Danger record, uh, and and that yeah, that so that brings us to there. That is interesting. So that was one of the questions a lot of people wanted me to ask, because I think so when I covered the Bang Bang solo and I put it right. out there and you have to realize, you know, obviously, if you didn't grow up with the music and see, I was a liner notes kid. I wanted to read every liner notes I could find because I loved that on vinyl tapes, CDs. You could pull out the thing and see who was on the record. And so when I covered it, it was so funny because there's all these things in music where somebody was in a band and then this guy was in the band and then they overlap and it was you and Andy Timmons. So when I rate, when I did bang, bang, somebody goes, wait a minute. I thought that was Andy Timmons. I'm like, no, that was Tony Bruno. Tony Bruno did the majority of the guitar work, except for a few songs, which thank God Discogs has that I believe correct. And it shows kind of the yeah. ones you were on, but that's the interesting part because there's that overlap between Soraya and danger, danger. And people were trying to figure out, Oh, that's the same guy. And so a lot of my comments have been cool. Cause I love to share the news with like a 23 year old that's discovering this music for the first time. Yeah. And I love to be like, if you like Tony Bruno's all over this record and this record and this record. And when I finished my guitar work on the record, they, they wanted me to be in the band. But then what happened was I was in Philadelphia doing that danger, danger record. And 
I get a call from the producer who's now doing the Soraya record. And th this is just so weird because Al and I talk about this all the time. So they called Al Petrelli but, the to, guy. Do the, the, <laughs> yeah. to do the uh, the Soraya record. <laughs> but the, the how was his name? I'm trying to remember the producer's name. Crazy deal. I'll remember it in a second. He basically told Sandy and Greg, and he was, you know, he's from Texas. He's like, he's like, this guy's good, but he goes, I, I, I want the guy who played in these demos. That's the guy I want on this record. And they were like, no, we, he's out of the band. That's it, and all this stuff. And he absolutely, re he refused. He said, like, if I'm going to produce this record, I want that guy to do this because I, you guys play me these demos, and I got so used to all this stuff. It just, it's so perfect for the songs. Like, I, I don't want somebody else doing their take on it. Mm. So they were, I mean, they were kind of pissed. They were like, really didn't want me back in the band. And then he called me up. They didn't even call me up. And he's like, you know, this, uh, uh, Jeff Glixman, he's like, he goes, hey, this is Jeff Glixman. Because I'm, I'm here in the, you know, the studio with Sandy and Greg. He goes, we all need you back here to do, record the record. And I was like, well, I'm in the middle of recording another record. He's like, when do you finish? I'm like, uh, probably in a week or two. And he's like, we can't wait that long. I'm like, well, okay, so I'm just going to leave this session. I mean, like, you, you tell me what to do here. I said, and by the way, I said, not to be like the guy who's now holding the cards. I go, you tell Sandy if she wants me to play on the record, she needs to call me herself. Yeah. And I held the phone. And it was like, and, and Bruno was like, Bruno was like, uh-oh. He goes, he goes, this is, the drama starts. I'm like, you know, so we had a good laugh about it. But then, you know, it took her about a week to call me and she called me and, um, and she's like, look, you know, Jeff really wants you to do this record. I'm still pissed at you. I'm like, well, that's fine. I said, I can just do the record. And then you guys can hire Al, whoever you want to do the tour or be in the band for, you know, for real. Uh, I said, I'm probably going to do this Danger Danger tour anyway. And then uh, we finished the Danger Danger thing. And then Andy came in because they were like, okay, Bruno's leaving to do a record. Mm. They wanted to get like, you know, promotion stuff happening right away. And I wasn't going to be available. So they found Andy. who I mean, God bless him. He's such a monster guitar player. Yeah. And. I think when they found them, they wanted him to be a part of the record. So that's why they recorded more songs. So we didn't really overlap. Okay. Like Andy came in after I left. Um, and then when I did the Soraya thing, I mean, I knew this was going to happen too. Halfway through the record, it was just like we became buds again. And, you know, we're all hanging out, we're having beers. And she's like, you're an asshole. I'm like, you're an asshole. And she goes, but I still love you. I still love you too. And like, you know, like it's just that kind of thing. Yeah. So really, and just to circle back, I, I always want to make sure I get it. So like, <clears throat> it really came down to you not signing over, you know, 50% of the rights and they kind of got a bad deal. And that's kind of what started all that, the drama, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, David Sonomer was a very old school manager. Yeah. Great. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's a legend and yeah. he knows, really knows what he's doing, but he, you know, that, that was one of those bad deals they used to make back, you know, in like in the sixties and stuff when all those Brill building, uh, building people got screwed yeah. and it just got a lump sum for writing the biggest songs of our lifetime, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I wasn't down with it. And and the weird thing is, uh, and this kind of sucks because it, it was the end of Soraya, but like, he didn't manage me. Mm -hmm. So he managed Sandy and Greg. Mm. So when she met, well, maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but I'll just say this and you can always circle back. Yeah. When she, uh, when we finished that record, and obviously we had, you know, a decent amount of success with it. When it came to do the second record, uh, she decided that's it. I don't want any part of him, and she fired David. Mm. And we we signed with Q Prime with mm. uh, Cliff Bernstein mm -hmm. and um, Peter Mensch. Uh, and and it happened because Sandy met Brian Wheat, the bass player from Tesla. Yeah. And then they were became you know they became an item and stuff. And he was the one convinced that you should sign with Q Prime. So she fired David. But honestly, with in with hindsight, it was a big mistake because first of all. Like Polygram had a bias out of that deal, and it they were so they spent so much money that the second record they were like we're going to release one single and if it doesn't take off it's it. Mm. But also, David, I have to say to his credit, we were it for him. Like we were the focus of of his thing, and we weren't really it for Q Prime. They already had Metallica, they had the Smashing Pumpkins, mm -hmm. they had Tesla. We were at the bottom of the list, mm. so it was it was it was kind of a bad business move, and it ended up being a demise of the band. But you know, we had a couple of good years there. Um. All right, I'm going to go back and we're going to geek out as guitar players for a second, if you're okay with that. Uh, so what I love to hear is, 
So the way I grew up was I and I've said this many times, so I won't repeat myself for those that have watched every episode. But I grew up in the early 80s, mid 80s. It was like the, the Yamaha school of music was learn by ear and then we'll teach you the sheet music. So I right. still see theory as black and white keys. And so on the guitar, it was 100 percent by ear. It was me stopping a vinyl record or stopping a cassette. And later on, you couldn't do it with CD. So I was like, ah, I'm going to skip that. We'll put it on tape where I can go back and forth quick. But it was right. like, I'm going to hear it. And so what I think is cool about this, and I always ask this question, and you kind of answered it already, was were you somebody that was real theory heavy growing up and then that just you know went into your playing or were you more of an ear player? And it's so funny whether I talk to Dan Huff or Tim Pierce or anybody, everybody always says, like, ah, I couldn't read outstanding, but, you know, I kind of knew <laughs> enough, like, to get around the guitar or – you know, I'd right. play this. I didn't know I was playing a Dorian scale. That's just what it sounded like to me. And that was always me. And that I hear from kids all the time. I think there's so much information on the Internet that I think they yeah. almost get self-conscious. Like, well, if I don't know all these things, I guess I'm not as good. And I can't be Tony Bruno and I can't be Tim Pierce and I can't be Dan Huff and I can't be Steve Stevens because I don't know all the theory. And so I should just give up. And there's kids I've taught lessons to that felt that way. And I so I love to tell it's fun for me to tell young people like. You don't have to know every piece of theory to like pick up this instrument and love it or pick up the piano and love it or pick up this and love it. Like if you just play a song, it, it it's a wealth of information getting your fingers underneath something. And so I think that's so cool. And, and so my question is always, how do you visualize the fretboard when you were because I think your solos are just masterful. And so for me and also let me not take away from your rhythms part, like there's parts on Gypsy Child. I just love kind of what's going on in the background and the bridge work and all the stuff you've done with other artists is really cool. But how do you look at the fretboard? Cause everybody always gets into this. Well, I have boxes and shapes and I look at it more this way and I look at it horizontally and vertically from Tony Bruno's perspective. If you were sharing with a young person, kind of your keys to looking at the guitar theoretically, but more, you know, by ear, what would you kind of say to that? And I'm sorry, that's a long winded question. No, no, it's fine. Actually, it's a good question because um, I feel it's information that people starting out should know. So first of all, like my theory has always been, and you know, it took a, a, a little bit of time for me to recognize it. But again, like you said, there wasn't all that information out there. So it was easier to just say, I, I think I'm right about this. Yeah. Like, People have asked me to teach and teach solos, and I'm like, I don't know how you teach a solo because for me, it's something that's born within your head, mm -hmm. and if it if it sounds right to you, it probably is right. Mm -hmm. And if you start measuring against you know any kind of you know scales or something or something that's very you know classically correct or not, then you could really put yourself in a position where, like you said, you have so so many self doubts, you just throw in the towel. Yeah, I feel like. Like, I grew up listening to people like, I mean, people don't hail this guy at all, but I do. Rick Derringer is oh, like <clears throat> one of my absolute favorite guitar players of all time. Yes. If you listen to the solo on Loosen Up Your Grip on the Blue Derringer record, yeah, like, it's it's so well thought out. It's so emotional. It basically is, and this is what solos should be, it's a, it's a replacement for the melody of the vocal. Mm -hmm. When the vocal disappears, something needs to take over, and it needs to be as melodic and as soulful and as um, and as uh, genuine as the vocal line. If it starts to be derivative or um, or calculated, I don't think it's going to grab anyone. So, are there any rules to that? I don't think so. I mean, there's a couple of notes you can't play against certain chords, but you know, if you play a blue note that is like, oh, that doesn't really fit in the scale, but God, it sounds good. Mm -hmm. Then it's then it's good. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. then it's good. And I don't look at the neck. Um, like in a box shape, like a lot of people, a lot of young players start out by learning scales and everything within two, three frets and up up that three frets and down that three frets, like a pentaton and thing like that. I like to look honestly at a guitar neck uh, more like a violin mm. where violin players like will do stuff like, you know, they'll just, uh, they'll go up, you know, like. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. To, to get the same same notes because first of all it moves you <clears throat> to a place on the neck where you can go other places yeah and you're already there as opposed to you're playing those same notes with the three frets and now you want to jump to a high note but you got to work your way up there because it's you're just never going to make that jump yeah you know yeah. and 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 you're you know one of my favorites tim pierce is like the master of that shit. yeah 
In yeah. fact, I have, I've, if he's watching this, you, you, you need to tell me what the solo in Living in Oz is all about because <laughs> that, that's one of those ones. I'm just like, I have no idea what he's doing here. I'm going so I'm that- I'm to cut this clip and I'll just text it to him and go, Tony has a question. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, like, you know, like, if you remember the first Soraya record, the, yeah. uh, the, the song Fire to Burn. Yes. Okay. That solo is a direct nod to his solo in uh, Affair of the Heart. Wow. It's the it's it's the literally I it was like, you know, he does that bah, holds that one note and they go right that's the, that's the that's the solo in Fire to Burn. Oh. It's it's the Tim Pierce knot and it's and it's that it goes up and it gets all the way up to the top just like Desmond Child would want it, you know. And, oh, uh, that is and it's just so one cool. of those things Yeah, but it's one of the things if you look at the way he, or if you learn his stuff and the way it is, it is not it is not this way. It is no. all going up this way. And it and it what it does is it it frees you up to to jump back if you're up here to the low E string to place you know and and that's kind of like if you look guys like Ingve Malmsteen they also play that way yes um they, yes. they don't look at the neck as you know these three frets and then these three frets no that's and, a good point and, that's yeah good and point. I and I would say I agree 100 percent with you like if if you have to develop one thing if it's sight reading versus your ear the ear has to be first yeah because yeah then you could play with anyone you know what I mean I, yes. I've been yes. working a, a lot with classical musicians on some projects I work, and I realize if you don't put music in front of them, there was there will be no sound coming from their instrument. <laughs> it, it's weird. It's a weird thing for guys like us. I, it's, it's very like, well, weird. It's like, man, like, I don't care. We're, we're, we could play. We could play anything right now. If you want to play fusion, at least I can hang in here for a little bit. But like, <laughs> exactly. But like, if if, if if you throw down like Bach, and that's the only thing that I can play, is if that's in front of me. That's yeah. I, it doesn't make sense to me because I was such. I always thought I was too dependent on the ear and then it's what is it the old saying it's like the older you get you realize what you do know and you realize how much you actually don't know but the older I got I was like you know what I realized is the ear was not a limitation and me not knowing as much theory as the next guy was actually not a limitation hey you know you were born with good ears you know I talked to one of the guys that is a genius that I I talked to that doesn't give enough credit because he was only on the scene for a short time was Mark Diglio of XYZ Mm -hmm. and here's a guy that like you know, and I, I, I told him, I talked to him yesterday and I told him, I said, you're kind of a genius. Like the way your ear works, I just, I can't teach that. I can't put that on sheet music. Like you just hear stuff and you know where to go. And I, I, so yeah, I look at it now as the ear is such a huge thing. I always encourage kids like, man, if you can develop that ear, that's like, I love what Rick Beato does with the ear training class. Like I just, yeah. anything that you can do to get that ear going, I think is doubly important. Not that theory is not important, but I just think it's so much more important. Let me keep going with guitar geek stuff. Yeah. What was kind of go through the 1980s and then into the nineties. I know we got a lot more of your awesome career to get to, but like, what was your setup? What guitars did you like, especially your high gain stuff? Like, did you like, a? Uh, was it a Floyd? Were you always a Floyd guy? Were you more of a, a Kaler guy? I mean, what, what was your kind of setup, you know, especially with, I love your trem work. So I think what you did in the sustain and uh, I still try to copy it, but I. It's uh, weird. Cause if you remember that time, like, I, and I don't know how I fell into that. I still have those guitars, but that, that was, was cool. the big, yeah, that was the big ESP Kramer. Yeah. Like decade. Yeah. Yeah. You know, ES, ESPA, um, ESP took the guitar world by storm for at least eight years. Yeah, yeah. It was like, you know, it was huge. And Matt was great. He was giving the guitars away left and right. So that was it. I had this Lake Placid Blue, um, I guess it's their first model of uh, tel- uh, Stratocaster bodies with a Floyd Rose that they put in. Um, <laughs> because my my Stratocaster, me and my buddy tried to put a Floyd Rose in and pretty much ruined a 72 Strat. Oh. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still have the body. Like just just to remember my mom buying it for me, but just, there's no chance of putting this guitar back together. Tony, send it to me. I'll try to fix it for you. And we'll send and, it oh, back. I should send it to you. That's yeah. a good idea. <laughs> but, but the uh, but yeah, that Lake Placid Blue, and then I put a Super Two Demarzio in the in the bridge, and the other um, the other pickups. I left the the, the, the stock ESP. They actually had a the ESP is single coil pickups. For me, had a little bit more of a um, a Hendrixy tone than the uh, like the the Fender Fat Strats and stuff yeah. like that. Um, I don't know. They just had this hollow sound to them that was so pure. So I'm like, I like this. Yeah. And quite honestly, like back in those days, like getting out of the bridge position pickup was like once every 500 songs. <laughs> it's like everything was back then. You know, like you listen. Like I was, I was obsessed with like Warren D. Martini. I was oh, obsessed I, with too. his guitar tone. Me too. You yeah. know, 
And his his sound was very much that. So the the rig was God. What the hell was that? I think it was called the, the it was the ADA. Oh, the MP one. Um, the MP one. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah. But it took me a long time to figure out how to use that thing. So we're guitar players, right? Yeah. We you know we go up to an amp, and we go okay. The 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 mids should be on like five or six. Yep. The high should be around like eight, and the low end should be five or a little bit lower because I don't want it too woofy. I want that thing. Yeah. If you, but but the but the that thing was like engineered differently. Like zero was basically um, like, I don't know, more like nine or 10. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember when I first started getting it, everything was just so saturated. I'm like, this thing sucks. I can't get a good tone out of it. And somebody said, hey, dude, you, you're doing it all wrong. You got to go negative on this thing. Yeah. You got to pull it back because it, it's yeah, already built like, for speed. <laughs> right. It was it was built for, as an assault. Yes, so yes. so I, I started going, you know, then I started getting these great tones out of it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is this is insane. I love that. So that was my main rig for like all those tours. Yeah. Except for when we did the second Soraya record. Um, no, okay, hold on. I got to tell you this. We yeah, that was the main rig for uh, like basic tracking and for the tours. But we were tracking. Uh, I'm in I'm in Woodstock right now. I have a house up here, and I'm and Bearsville Studios is like a mile from here. Well, it's not there anymore, but uh, yeah. that's where we did that record, and we did the tracking there. But then when we did the overdubs, the Jeff Glicksman, the um, producer, was like, so I had a couple of. Uh, I had a couple of uh, uh, Marshall Plexis thrown in the studio, and uh, he goes, I just went around to the local guitar stores, and I got, like, you know, a bunch of guitars in there. So I'm like, dude, I don't know why you did that. I'm, I, I have my rig. He's like, no, we're just going to play through it. So we would do this thing. The band would come in. We would do, like, background vocals, all of Sandy's lead vocals in the daytime, and then they would all leave. We would take a dinner break. Jeff and I would come in at, like, 11 o'clock at night and work till the sun came up. And the, I'll never forget the first day we went in there, like I plugged into this Plexi with not even my Strat, a, a stock Strat. And I literally played one chord. And when I heard come through the speakers, just literally leveled me. <laughs> I was I, 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 I was at the point where I was like, we got to redo all the basic tracks. And he's like, no, no, he goes, because this is going to sit really well on top of your thing. And I mean, literally, it was just this Plexi. We didn't even touch the dials. And the first solo we did was uh, running out of time. Mm. With, with which is like the most challenging solo on that record, and I played it in one pass with that because I was so inspired with that guitar sound. Oh, I love I was just that. Like, and then they, those guys came in the next day. They were like, they're like, what the heck? Like, like, what is that? I'm like, I don't, like, I don't know, dude. And Jeff told me to plug in this thing, and I lost my mind. They were like, this is incredible. I'm like, I know. It's, it's actually something I don't think I could play a second time. But uh, did yeah, you, so that was. Did, did you get to keep the plexis? Is what I'd like to know. No, dang. I, I, and I wanted to buy them, but they weren't for sale. Oh, man. Uh, I was like, we need to buy these. But uh, I do have a Plexi. And actually, you know what I have, which is my go-to amp now, is a Friedman small box. I love Friedman. I, I am such a Friedman fan. It's not even funny. I just... Dude, that, the small box basically is a Plexi. Yeah. What I love about it is my favorite interview I heard with Dave Friedman was he was doing an interview with uh, an amp tech guy on YouTube that I follow that's really great. And um, he goes, what, what are... <sighs> What's your kind of music, Dave? Like, what do you like? And I just, he goes, anything with like a loud marshally sound. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> that makes so much sense. Like, yeah. because it's, it's kind of like when I talked to Mark Diglio about the whole Morin preamp thing, where it's like he took a Marshall right. and then he modded it. And that's what's on that Hungry record that XYZ did. That everyone's like, well, how do you sound like that? And how to, you know, whatever. And, but it is, it's like, I love that you can get these unbelievable sounds without, you know, peeling the paint off the wall. Um, right. And but it's so true to like like you said, it's that one chord that you hear and you're like, oh, my God, that's what I've been kind of searching for forever. And that's what I want to, you know. And so, yeah, I'm such a huge fan of of his stuff. Yeah. And the and the other thing about amps like that, like like Plexi's really good Plexi's and that it's like. It's not just your go-to guitar that sounds like that through it. It's any guitar you play through yes. it sounds as it becomes the best version of that guitar. Yes. It's like, that's when you know you got a good amp. I'm like, okay, this thing. So like, for instance, the Friedman, and I don't want to be an endorsee for Friedman now, but if you want to send me an amp, it's cool. Um, <laughs> like, if I plug my telly, my stock, or back here, my telly that I bought at a pawn shop, be like in, you know, 1994, um, if I plug that into it, it's not too trebly and twangy. Mm. 
mm-hmm. it still sounds like I could play. I could literally, it sounds more like Pete Townsend through that amp. Yes. Isn't you know that I mean? wild? And so that's a mark of a good amp. Yeah. So tell me, so post Soraya, now what's next for Tony Bruno? What happens next in the timeline? So after Soraya broke up, I formed this band called Head. Okay. Uh, with this guy, Michael Brayman from this band Crush. They were signed to Elektra. Um, him and I just lived in the same building in Brooklyn. And we ran into each other a bunch of time. I'm like, he looks cool. And we we started writing songs. I got to send you a copy of this record. It's, it is honestly one of the best records that, I mean, it, it's such great songwriting and such yeah. great songs. Back in the grunge time, the, the, the reason why we had like, a showcase at CBGB's and every single label head was there. And Michael managed to piss every single one of them off because he was like, after the show, they were all like, we want to have a meeting with you. And he was just like, so arrogant that everyone just said, I can't work with this guy and including me. So it was kind of a heartbreak, but that Mm. took up like, you know, a a major year and a half of my life. But honestly, the body of work is so good. And then um, right during that time, my buddy, Tommy Burns, who plays with Billy Joel, uh, he was playing with Joan Jett. His uh, firstborn, his daughter Bonnie, was being born. And he was telling Joan's manager uh, that he's not going to be able to go to Japan with them because he's not missing the birth of his child. Sure. And Kenny Lagoon, I don't know if you know anything about him, but he's he's like one of those old school dudes. He's funny as hell. But he was like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be fine. Babies come, babies come. It'll be fine. <laughs> and he, and he, so Tommy calls me up. He's like, dude, he goes, I, I've been telling Kenny I'm not going to Japan. He goes, he's not listening to me. He goes, I need you to do me a favor. I'm like, what? He goes, can you just learn these songs and just show up at rehearsal at SIR? And, and I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, I'll tell them. He goes, but you know, he goes, just learn. So, you know, this is like, he sends me a cassette of like 30 songs. And the thing about Joan is like, you know, and this is not a disparaging comment. She's basic rock and roll. So, so many of those chords, songs are the same chords in a different order. Sure, sure, and sure. It's, it's very, very hard to keep track of what song is. And I, I I literally immersed myself in that. And then I show up at SIR assuming like the whole thing's cool. She's not there. Uh, Tommy Price, the drummer, is there. And Kenny Aronson, the bass player, there. And I walk in and they both know me. I'm like, Bruno, what's going on? What are you across the hall? I'm like, no, I'm here. And they're like, what do you mean here? We're like, we're, we're rehearsing with Joan. I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm rehearsing with Joan. And immediately I know what's going on, right? Yeah. I go, Burns uh, Burns didn't tell you? They're like, no. And and they both start laughing. They're like, Joan's going to, f-. they were laughing. She's going to flip out. <laughs> she literally flipped out. I mean, she flipped out. But <sighs> I, I basically told her, I'm like, look, I understand. I said, I can leave uh, or you can let me play through the set. She's like, well, how many songs you know? I'm like, I know them all. And she's like, well, Tommy sang background vocals, too. I'm like, yeah, I know all the background vocals. Part. And then we went through the whole set. She just turned around. She's like, okay, uh, I guess you can come to Japan with us. And then <laughs> I ended up staying with them for f- almost six years. Wow. Yeah. Man. Well, because because Tommy, during that time, he's, he got to have his, you know, watch his And then he got the call for the Billy Joel gig. Oh. So it worked out. It was like this passing of the torch thing. That's so cool. What is it like? Tim Pierce, of all people, was like, you know, there was a thing, like, if... There was a respect thing at a certain point, especially in the 80s and 90s and you know 70s. It's like, if I'm leaving a band, you better, or I'm leaving a tour, you better have a replacement you can dial up and call. Right. You know, exactly. that's cool. That's cool. Well, wait, I got to, you got to remind me something. Before I get, before we drop Soraya, I have to, this is my favorite Tim Pierce story. So the last Soraya tour we do, it's, we're opening up for Bad English. Mm, yeah. And um, like, I've, I have to say, this is one of the best compliments I ever got from anyone we get to Clearwater, Florida. We're doing one of these festivals. Uh, Christina Aguilera, in her beginning of her career, she's on it. Bad English is on it. Um, and we're on it. And Neil Sean finds our bus and comes on the bus and finds me mm. and introduces himself. And he's like, he says, literally, he's like, I get choked up thinking about it. He's like, he goes, dude, we've been listening to your guys' record since we, you know, right before we decided we wanted you guys to open for us. He goes... He goes, I think the solo on Healing Touch is one of my top five solos of all time. And I was like, I was like, I'm like, hold on, dude. I go, this is, this is going to be a lot for me to take in. I go, you're Neil Sean. And he's like, no, dude. He goes, that's great. I'm like, well, you know what? You can thank Robert Holmes. He's like, who's Robert Holmes? I go, listen to Till Tuesday. <laughs> dude, I said, listen, listen to the Welcome Home record. Listen to his shit on that. I said, I already told him. I met him at the China Club. I think I may have lifted one of your solos <laughs> really close <laughs> to one of our songs. I go, because he's a great guitar player, all soul. Like, I always feel like 
My, I tell people, I'm like, you know who the best pop guitar players would be? People who write top lines for songs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like top liners would be the best guitar players ever. Sure. Because uh, they just get it. So Neil was like, oh, I got to listen to that. So the, tying in Tim Pierce to this. So we get on this tour and now Tim, uh, you know, uh, Neil and I become like best buddies. We're hanging out every single day. He's like riding on our bus sometimes. And we have, we do this thing. The girl was the, the rep for Kramer came to two shows in Burlington, Vermont. The shows got snowed out. So mm -hmm. we spent two days on our bus just drinking beers, bullshitting and hanging out. And she was, uh, she was like basically stuck with us. And she's like, let's do a, let's do like a, a TV show. You guys critiquing guitar players. Mm. So she's filming. And I, God, I wish I had a copy of this because she's filming me, me and Neil. And we're getting a little bit more drunk as this goes along. <laughs> and, and she's bringing up people. And she's like, you know, okay. She's like Richie Sambora. And like, you know, we're doing like pass or fail and explaining who we like about it. And she's going through these people. And then she's like, okay, uh, favorite guitar player. And then I forgot who Neil said. And he says to me, favorite guitar player, I'm like, Tim Pierce. And he's like, who the hell's Tim Pierce? And I look at him, I'm like, I'm like, who the hell's Tim Pierce? I go, are you sure you're Neil Sean? <laughs> so he's just like, what? I go, how do you not know who Tim Pierce is? So I start telling him, I'm like, dude, like the, all this Rick Springfield stuff. And I start going through his whole catalog of works. And he's like, Oh, he goes, ah, he goes, Rick Springfield. He goes, ah, I have nothing to do with that crap and stuff like that. So we take a break for Christmas. And as a joke, I buy him the Rick Springfield catalog and I give it to him. And I'm like, before you like throw this stuff in the garbage, I want to play you one song. I go, you figure out the solo and show me how it goes. And I, I play him the Living in Oz solo. And he loses his mind. He listens to it like 10 times. And he's like, who is that? I'm like, that's Tim Pierce. And then Jonathan Cain is in earshot. He goes, What's Tim Pierce? I'm like, this solo. He's like, oh, he was my roommate for three years. He goes, I have stacks of instrumental cassettes from that, too. <laughs> and I'm like, what? So, yeah, yes. this, this, this went down a rabbit hole of, like, the rest of the tour. All we did was listen to Tim Pierce's, like, instrumental shit in the back of oh. my bus. <laughs> the dude yeah, deserves was... so much. I mean, he's, he's, he, he's incredibly talented. I've said I think he's the best teacher right now on the planet in terms yeah. of the way that he can make complicated look simple. Uh, his, but he's also just the kindest human being that right. I think I've one of the kindest human beings I've ever met. And I, that combination is so rare. You know what I mean? Just, it, yeah. it, it's, you meet a hero and you're always worried like, Oh, is this going to go badly? Or are they going to be kind of, a, and that's okay if they are, it's like, you know, we're all different, but yeah. it was like, man, he's just, he's such a good, before we get off Soraya too, you have to tell the story that we were talking about off camera yeah. about, uh, the 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 guy that was blasting it after you finished the record in the oh, yeah, apartment. Yeah. <laughs> he was. Uh, I, I was telling John earlier that um, the the record came out, uh, and I we literally. I mean, it came out really quickly after the set. The label setup was quick, so I had been. You know, we've been in the studio so long doing that record between you know writing the songs and the, all the drama that we talked about before me being thrown out of the band and all the demos and stuff like that. So by the time the record came up, I did not want to hear any more Soraya for a good long time. I knew we had to go on tour, but I really just needed a break. And by just some like, you know, fate or like cruel punishment, this guy lived across the street from me in Riverdale in the Bronx. And he like was a massive fan. Every morning he would start his day with his windows open, blasting this record. And I, I literally, for the first week, I thought it was my, uh, my ex-wife, Lisa, I was married at the time, like playing a, like a cruel joke on me. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm like, I go, I cannot believe she's, I'm, I'm going to, I walk into the room and I'm like, just, she's not even home. And then I, I finally, I realized it's coming from this guy's house. And I'm like, I'm wondering how long this is going to last. And, and then eventually I, it just didn't stop and over there to knock on his window or knock on his door and, and ask him. And he like literally had a semi heart attack. He, first of all, he thought I was stalking him or some kind of weird shit. He's like, what are you doing here? I, I mean, like why? I mean, he's like, not that I, not because I, I can't even believe you're here. I'm like, it gets better. I go, I live right there. I go, and I'm like, I go, you're killing me with this record. And he was just laughing. He, he's like, I, I, and we just became friends. We're like still friends. He lives down in Florida now. We keep in touch. But it was a really funny oh, thing. That's so great. Was that the first record or the second record? The first record. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, I love that story. That's great. You know what I think's cool is that you said earlier that you kept a lot of your guitars. A lot of guys have like, 
like Mark Digley and I went on this hunt for his yellow Charvel that he had that somebody <clears throat> stripped and put on reverb one day. And we were talking about stuff and I've talked to people. It's like, oh, you know, and John McCurry's like, I still have this one guitar that, but I've changed necks since then. But right. it's cool that you still have quite a few guitars from back in the day. Most of us guitar players, we keep the sentimental ones if we can afford it, but sometimes we need cash and out the door it goes. But, you know, most of the time it gets sold. That's really cool that you've you've got all those. Yeah, stuff. Only, only one guitar that I, I, I sold, it was a Les Paul Pro with this, you know, P90 soap bar pickup. I regretted it forever. And then I did a gig uh, like about five years ago in Fire Island, a fun gig, and the front of house guy came up to me and said, by the way, I have that guitar you sold. And I was just like... <laughs> Oh wow! He's like, I'm not selling. Don't even come up with a price because it's not happening. I was like, all right, I get it. You know. <laughs> and then what happened after that? Because what I think is so cool is when I go through your credits and stuff. It's like, it's it was like Tony Unleashed, and that you have songwriting credits, and you were doing stuff on soundtracks and Rihanna, and you're doing all this stuff. It's like, how did the world of music really just continue to open up for you? Uh, Throughout the '90s and into the 2000s and all that. Well, I think that's funny because I like another thing I would tell people is like you got to know when your path is taking you somewhere and and not mm -mm. and not be like you know the guy to mess up your own career or your own life path because sometimes it's hard. It's, it, it, sometimes it's easy, but this one was a hard one. So we were playing with Joan Jett. We did a tour in Germany, uh, opening for this guy Udo Lindenberg, who's kind of like an icon over there. He's like the Sinatra mm. of, uh, of Germany. Mm. And Nana, uh, 99 Luft Balloons. Uh, fame came to the show in Hamburg uh, and after and this is really funny because there's so much history here but I don't have enough time for it uh, she was like uh, came backstage and she was like I really would like if you guys could be my band for a tour and I'm like well we're Joan's band <laughs> but she's like I, and she's this is the way she speaks she's like it, it's, she's a very sweet person but very you know German in some respects in this respect yeah but it would be good if you were my band <laughs> And I'm like, well, I'd be, I'm, I was like, it'd probably be good for you and, and probably for all of us. I'd, I'm like, but I don't think it'd be good for Joan. Um, anyway, <laughs> it it kind of haunted me, uh, the idea of like, you know, this artist that, you know, she's like icon over there. And I, we, I asked Joan and it was a flat out no and everything. And then I kept saying it. And then I thought about, well, maybe it's time for me to leave. But then Joan was taking a break and it just coincided. So we were able to, the whole Blackheart band was able to do this tour with Nana. And mm. then at the end of the tour, um, it was time to go back with Joan. Nana asked me if I would produce one of her records. And she had a studio in her house. And she's like, you would live here for a year. And it was just, I'm like, that's it. That's what that's what's supposed to happen now. So mm. I quit Joan. Uh, it was hard because we were super buds. And we still are. Um, but it was tough. And yeah. um, I ended up staying with her. And then like did three years with Nana, produced a record, did a few tours with her. And then during that, I got a call for the Enrique Iglesias gig while I was in Germany. Mm. But, the, but the thing about the German thing, this is the part I love. Um, she says to me, and one uh, after a sound check, she, she had an interview and she comes on the bus. I'm like, how'd the interview go? She's like, really good. You should meet this girl from the newspaper. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm single. I'm having a great tour. No, but you should really meet this girl. from. And we've been married 25 years this past May. Oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah. Wow, Isn't that crazy? How cool is that? Yeah. So I, I the, the reason why it's funny is like one of the things I gave my wife uh, for our twenty fifth. I wrote a sonnet about our whole story, and that line is in there. You know, um, <sighs> you should meet the girlfriend. The whole story is in there. That but, is so amazing. And I just went, that is a I, cool I just went story. back and did a private gig with Nana two months ago in Austria. It's the first time I'd seen her since God knows how long. Yeah. Oh, talk about full circle moment. I know it's crazy. Wow. And the, so the Enrique thing happened. I got a call for during that. I didn't know what the hell he was. And um that's how the whole music director started happening. We did um I met Enrique. We he played me a bunch of stuff and I'm like, sounds good. Um i I don't know much about Latin music, but I know I can play it. And that was me the talk you and I said before, you know play a bunch of, you know, I could fake my way through fusion or I could fake my, like in my head, yes. I'm like, I'm going to speak. I'm going to walk the talk to talk and then eventually walk the walk. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, exactly. And I did. And I, 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 I learned enough about it. Then I sat and, and started playing with him and it became like, okay, this is going to be a, a career because like, I think this guy's going to take off. And our first TV show was the Jay Leno show. And the, the, mm. the, um, the director of the show came walking up and he was like, so who's on charge in the band? And nobody spoke up. 
So what do you do? You go, oh, I am, <laughs> you know. And all of a sudden I'm having conversations with the guy about this and about that and how the song starts and how that and how we're going to end. And his manager calls me into the dressing room afterwards. And he's like, uh, Tony, I saw the way you were talking to the director. And I'm like, oh, here I go. I'm going to get scolded. He goes, I think you should be the music director of the band. I'm like, you're like, I had some run-ins in the past where this didn't go yeah, this yeah. way. So I was just making I know. sure. I was like, so, so all of a sudden I'm the music director and like, you know, and it's in cool. the beginning it didn't mean much, but all of a sudden I'm putting together like a lot of cool arrangements for him and stuff. And that started that whole path. When you were asked to be a producer and then you're asked to be a music director, I think what's cool about this is like, this was the first time, like you're just, they're just throwing you in the deep end and let's go. It was cool. Like to, uh, knowing Butch Walker, how they were just like, Hey, we got this band called SR 71 and there's this girl named Avril Lavigne. Would you like to produce her record? It's like, what? I, I don't know. Like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And now of course he's, he's a famous producer. It's like, was that kind of how you felt going in? Like I'm a duck out of water, but same thing with like guitar playing to use that metaphor. It's like, I'll just talk the talk until I can walk the walk. Type yeah, I mean, thing. you, you got to know that you're up to the task, but you also have to know how much work's involved. Uh, but I was always yeah. one of those people like, you know, I know I can do anything if somebody puts it in front of me and gives me the opportunity. Uh, and I'm, and even yeah. if I don't know anything about it, I'm going to dive in so head first. It's not even funny. I'm going to come out, you know, swimming and I'm going to be like better than anybody else because I'm going to make sure that I am. Uh, and I wouldn't say better than anyone else at everything, but better than anyone else that applies for that thing, because I'm like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. You know, it's like the chorus line. Um, but that was a, you know, a really cool journey with Enrique and I was with him for 12 years, but during that, I decided to move out to LA um, just for writing purposes and get involved in that world. And that was as much as I didn't like living in LA. Um, I, I made all the right connections with people. And then while I was out there, I got a call from one of Enrique's former production managers, uh, this guy, uh, Bill Thompson. And he, I'm still blowing my mind that these names are coming off my lips like that because uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't rehearse for this. So he was like, Hey, uh, he's, he's in a Southern boy. He's like, I, he goes, I'm production manager for this, uh, for this new girl. Now she's not new. This girl, Anastasia, she, she's really huge in Europe. And, uh, she just fired her MD. You want to do this? And Enrique was on a break. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I, I got involved with that. And there was this, uh, uh, choreographer on the thing, Tina Landon, who's, you know, she's a legend. She's done everything. Mm -hmm. And Tina and I like got on like a house on fire, and we started coming up with these crazy ideas for for um, Anastasia's show. I mean, really crazy stuff, like stuff like the emulated stomp and stuff like that. Really, just edgy stuff. And I was producing all the music for it and making all the tracks. And then that happened. And then you know we were we did two tours with Anastasia. Then I went back with Enrique, and then she got a call from Mark Jordan, who was uh, Rihanna's manager before um, Umbrella came out. And she was going to be mm -hmm. the choreographer. And she told Mark, you have to hire Tony Bruno for this. Like, he's the guy for this. So that's wow. my my favorite one was the Mark thing, because he I was in uh, I was in L.A. with my wife. We were leaving the next morning from Mexico. She was uh, seven months pregnant. And this guy calls me up. He's like, hey, this is Mark Jordan with Rihanna. I'm like, OK, I don't know what Rihanna is. And uh, but. He's like, he's like, look, I got a call from Tina. She says I should hire you. MD he goes, but I, I, he goes, I'm old school. I need to have a FaceTime with you. Uh, he goes, when can we meet up? I'm like, uh, he goes, you're in New York, right? I'm like, generally, yeah. I said, but right now I'm in LA and I'm boarding a plane from Mexico at seven in the morning. So he's like, shit. He's like, I can't hire you, bro, unless we unless we meet up. I need to know more about you as a person. I'm like, well, if you can wait, I'll be back in a week. He's like, no, I can't wait, can't wait. And then he hung up, and that was it, right? And I'm like, oh, I guess that's not happening. Like, wow. Like, no, the flight was at nine. We were leaving at, at like seven. I get a call at sure. six in the morning. He's like, hey, it's Mark again. I'm like, uh, hey, man, I'm, I'm leaving in like an hour for the airport. He goes, good. He goes, I'm right by your hotel. I'm like, in LA? He's like, yeah. He goes, I took the red eye last night. I'm like, how did you know what hotel I was at? He's like, oh, I, I <laughs> he's like, I have my sources. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, it's like some, yeah, some covert shit. Uh, and he's like, I'm at Duke's. Can you meet me there for coffee? So I, it's like right down the block from where I was staying. I run down the block. We have a couple of coffees. We talk. He asked me about, you know, my wife. I asked him about his life. We talk about just friend, nothing about Rihanna. He's like, come in the car for a minute. He sits in the car. He plays me Umbrella. He plays me Please Don't Stop the Music. He plays me Breaking Dishes and shows me a picture of her. He goes, do you want to do this? I'm like, yeah. yeah. I mean, she's like, she's like, she's smoking <laughs> yeah. hot. Her voice is killer. The songs are killer. 
Yeah. And then he's like, I got to talk to her yeah. and I got to talk to a bunch of people, but I'll let you know. And then when I got back from my vacation, we get back to, um, we get back to Brooklyn and my doorman's like, you got packages. And I had, they sent me the masters, the master drives, the hard drives to like the entire record. And I open it up. It's like, oh Rihanna, I'm like, Oh, I guess I'm doing this gig. And it was like, all right. So that's it happening. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. It was fun. I mean, Tony, what a cool damn. I mean, I, yeah. And, and on top of all this, you're doing songwriting and, and you're, I mean, when you look back at all this uh, and I, I want to hear what's happening up until today too, as well, <laughs> but like, what, what do you think when you look back on this amazingly cool, diverse, awesome, gargantuan career? Cause I think it's just too cool, man. Well, I think it's really nice of you to say that, John. I, I honestly, I look at it like, you know, some people think, well, I'm going to do this till I'm this age or, you know, like I can't wait to retire mm -hmm. and stuff. that. Musicians don't retire. They just they just right. find new gigs and it doesn't necessarily mean new guitar gigs, you know. And as you yeah. know, like the the guitar market, you know, as, like, as a player, even as a session player, it's a huge bite is getting taken out of it through AI and stuff like that. And it's becoming harder and harder to make a living doing that. So you have to kind of, you know, you have to diversify yourself. And I look back at, mm -hmm. I look at back when I decided, okay, I'm going to learn, you know, back in the Enrique days, I'm going to learn Cubase. I'm going to learn it really well. I'm going to mm -hmm. learn Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn Logic. I'm going to learn how to program drums. I'm going to learn how to, you know, orchestrate in case we needed it. So like when all, and I just did it because it was like, well, when you have downtime, instead of spending it sulking, you know, waiting for a gig, learn something new. You know, learn how to play the cello, mm, learn how to orchestrate, learn how to do so. You know, I learned how to orchestrate just by ear. And then I did do a, a Berkeley online course. But and and then it came in like, hey, a lot of the Rihanna stuff, you look at some of that stuff, like the NBA halftime jam, like she do these things and they'd be like, oh, and they ha and, and um, just because of the politics of the music business or like the Grammys, we did that like five times. Oh, classical music has to be represented, too. So you need to write an orchestration for this song or for that song. And, you know, and, mm. and if I'd never decided to dive into it, I'd have been like, okay, this is where I lose my gig. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or well, this is where they hire someone yeah. else and he's better than me. Yeah. So you kind of have to take yeah. your downtime and turn it into like creative time, you know? And I think if you do that, mm. um, every time something comes up and somebody says, no, you go, you can go, oh, I actually, I can do that. You know? And they're like, really, mm. you can do that. What are you most from a songwriting perspective? Cause I think that's a cool part of our, of your journey. What are you most proud of uh, the work that you've written, whether or not it gained massive popularity? Like what do you, as I want to ask you this about guitar work too, but like from a songwriting perspective and, and even an orchestration perspective or piecing together music, mm -hmm. what are you most proud of? Um, okay. So piecing together orchestration, I would say I have a show. I'll send you a link to it that i wrote yeah. with someone i did all the orchestrations it's it's called uh it was called rock me amadeus but uh we're tentatively trying to find a new name for it but it basically mashes up opera rock and classical music and the, i mean the orchestrations are sick and they're really fun so that i'm really proud of because we did a show in tampa in january and this was like one of those moments where you feel like you're, you're being ordained by the classical world finally <laughs> we brought, you know, we had a rehearsal and we, we hired a conductor, this guy, Jim Lau, who's a great conductor and, you know, great composer and super great dude. And he's, now we have the orchestra and, you know, the rock band there and we're running through the arrangements and the, the lead violin player looks at him. She goes, I just want to say, Jim, she goes, these arrangements are insane. And, and he mm. goes, oh, he goes, well, I can't take any credit. And he points to me and they all turn around and look at me with this, like, like they, like, you know, the, the guitar player, you know, oh, they're looking at me like, it. no way. And I, and I was just like, I said, you just made my day, everybody. You just made my day. I said, because I'm like sitting here watching oh. you guys, like they're going to poke a hole in this at any minute now. And then they're like, no, 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 there's no <laughs> holes, dude. This is crazy good. The, the, oh, that's I love that. But one of the, one of the, the songwriting awesome. things that, that uh, it's a story that, uh, again, you probably don't know the song because it was big in Germany, but back there on that wall is one of the, like, you know, five times platinum record we wrote this song, me and Tommy Burns, a guitar player from uh, Billy's band. We, again, so guys out there, right? Downtime, Billy wasn't on tour. Joan wasn't on tour. Neither one of us were on tour. And we were like, okay, we got to make some money. So we just got together and said, let's just write songs. Let's just write songs. Let's find some artist that maybe he's good enough to, or she's good enough to produce. And we, we were writing songs, writing songs, long story short, because it's a very long story. This one particular song got in the hands of a publisher in Germany 
And he called me up and said, uh, there's a show starting, this is 2001, called Pop Stars in Germany. It's basically a, um, it, it was the template for American Idol. It's a contest. Mm. Yeah. And uh, we want to submit your song. I'm like, great. And he's like, you know, there's like 500 submissions. Every week I would get a call from him. Okay, you're in the top 100. And I goes, now you're in the top 25. He goes, it looks like your song is going to be uh, submitted. And it was a pop song, but it was a very cool pop song. It started out as a mm. Google Dolls kind of song. And okay. I got really ambitious one night and said, uh, God, I wonder how this would translate as a dance song. And then that's the version that he got. Anyway, it ends up in the show. The girl group who ends up doing it wins the show. It ends up being the biggest single in the history of German music up until like three years ago. It wow. was like number one on Billboard for like 13 weeks. And oh but meanwhile, I'm over here. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in New York. I have no idea. And I have friends in Germany through the Nana thing and stuff. And they call them up like, like, do you know what's going on over here? I'm like, no, they're like, they're like, dude, your song is so big that they're quoting lyrics from it in Der Spiegel, which is their version of Time magazine. He's like, oh my I'm gosh. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, open up Billboard. He's like, you've been number one for three weeks now. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell? I, it was just like this thing. I'm like, okay, there's a lesson in what to do with your downtime. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's crazy. That is so cool, Tommy. I know. It was, and it was Dang. a shock because like, you know, we were just having fun, me and Tommy. When you look back on your work, same question with songwriting. Is there a particular solo riff, guitar playing? Is it that moment you plugged into a plexi and rocked that solo the first time? But when you look back, because it's so funny, Neil Sean mentioned Healing Touch. That's the one I've covered so far of yours from Soraya. So uh, I the, I love that solo um, and that song and, and both records. I mean, I could listen to pretty consistently. Uh, not next door neighbor, you know, next to you, but here where I live. That way it's not blurring in your ears. But um, is there a solo? Is there guitar work? Whether it is Danger, Danger, Soraya, beyond that, playing with anybody that you look back on that you're most proud of or that you're like man damn that was good you know what it's really funny because uh, if sandy ever sees this she'll she'll be the second one to you know verify this because the late nights i would do with jeff glicksman in um in austin texas doing that first saray record the the only solo that was not from there was on saint christopher's metal and we were in bearsville studios i had and you could tell it's a galleon kruger that's the sound but it was during the rhythm track of that, the solo came up. While I was doing the basic track, the, so, the solo section came up. And I, I don't know what happened, dude. I just played something that was like top liner worthy. Like, and I just started playing this thing. And it, it definitely has a Neil Sean vibe to it, 100%. Um, but we finished it. It was like 3.30 in the morning. And we played it back. And, and there was just dead silence in the room. And I turned around to Jeff. I, I'm like, not good? And he's like... I'm going to play this back for you. And he played it back and he, and I was just like, oh, it's actually kind of sweet. He goes, he goes, dude, it's, 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 I don't even know what to say about it. He goes, we can't replace that. And it's not a big solo. It's just melodic. Mm -hmm. It was just all from the yep. heart. And I was just, I, yep. I, I think about that solo. And I'm like, that's the kind of guitar player that I, I always wanted to be a guy that didn't have to prepare mm -hmm. and do, you know, mm -hmm. like a, a million takes or something. Although the run out of time one was the same thing. It was inspired by the amp, but this was just like me and him alone candles and like just feeling the hell out of her vocal performance and the slow groove of that song. And, and the, obviously the sentiment as to what the song means, it really always touched me that song. And I just playing that, I just, I was just like, yeah, that, you know what? The song just made me play that. I didn't, I didn't play that intentionally. The song told me this is what's happening right now. If you don't mind, I'm going to share my Tony Bruno favorites, at least from those two bands. And there's others, but I mean, from, from Danger Danger. So I, I had to cover Bang Bang because it's such an iconic solo. When you hear it on the radio, it's like, I know that solo before I even played it, I could hear it in my head, but under the gun oh, dude, on that. the Danger Danger record is my favorite Tony Bruno, Danger, Danger solo. And that's hard for me to pick one because I love so many of them, but that's one I'm going to do next. But I'm like, damn, I've got to like isolate that guitar so I can, because you did so many cool things and healing touches up there. But what I love about Gypsy Child is it, to me is that middle part you did, which is where you think the solo is going to go. It's a tease right. because you did a few things with some volume swells 
that I still can't, I, I gotta figure that part out how I'm supposed to, because one of the things I like to do on my channel is I use the original track, I don't monetize it, I, the artist obviously gets the credit, but I wanna use the original track, because I always think when we were kids, we listened to the original, we weren't doing some remake of the song, like I wanna hear your guitar and the little like nuances and try to put that in the tab. But what I love about that is, Somebody said the other day, they go, man, you got to do Gypsy Child, both the middle and his burnout oh. at the end that just rocks. And I was like, yeah, that's my favorite because there, what I love is what I think that both under the gun and that and the mix of that is what I think is so cool is your ability to mix fast, slow, your ability to mix trim work with tapping. Then all of a sudden you're grooving. Then all of a sudden it's kind of this slow blues jam. Then all of a sudden it's on fire. And then all of a sudden it's kind of in the middle and whether or not you end on a high right. note or not, it it is one of the reasons that I try to copy so much of your stuff and it's just your ability to mix and match that without it seeming like, oh, we got to punch in the tapping part or we got to not to say that, you know, at times you don't want to punch that man, but it is so fluid that when I listen to it and, and again, I love your trim work because it's like there is an elegance to it, if that makes sense. And I, this is not a kiss ass moment, but more of there is an elegance to being able to come up, come out. There is occasionally when you can go crazy, but it was like you said, it comes from the heart. It's well thought out. The song helped you do it. But I just think those two combined, if I could take all that and just take 1% and drop <laughs> it into my playing, That's I'd really be a happy sweet. guy. So anyway, I just had to tell no, you my, I appreciate uh, that. And My the trem work stuff, ones, I think, yeah. I think thinking back, it definitely comes from watching Jeff Beck's trem work stuff because his stuff was insane. Yeah. Like, and he would do it, like yeah. you said, he would do it in a way that wasn't like, you know, dive bomb stuff. It was like, how do I, how do I make, how do I stay on a note with this? And how do I get to the next note instead of, you know, fingering it like with the tremolo bar? Uh, I, it sure. It, the first guy actually turned me on to that thing was Aldo Nova. Remember him? Yeah. Oh my God. I just listened to him the other day. And I, I wrote like, a song. Oh, like, oh, I lived oh. with him for a year. <laughs> like, and like oh, wow. he, he was the first guy that ever I introduced me to a Floyd Rose, and he was like, you know, the, there's a song on that record we wrote together called "Victim of a Broken Heart" on the first, on the second record, and all that stuff with the bar is me playing his Les Paul with this thing on it, and he taught me how to do it. I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever, and then I'm like, I'm gonna do this on every song. <laughs> <laughs> it's like listening to Vito Brada. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, exactly. What? God, I remember seeing him. At, uh, I remember seeing those guys uh, at. Um, what the hell was it called? Lamore, mm. Lamore East. Mm. He had some fierce guitar tone. I'll tell you something. I got to send you something after this yeah. that you're going to love. And you're welcome to uh, share it with, uh, it hasn't been released yet, but you can share it on this if you want to. So I just produced something for this uh, girl. Her name is Militia Vox. Um, she's like a metal girl. We did a cover of Brian Adams, um, Brian Adams and Tina Turner, It's Only Love. But we, oh, but yeah, we did yeah. like a Nine Inch Nails cover of it. And nice. and we just kind of like I don't know the planets aligned. We I had done something with Corey Glover from Living Color, and I'm like, how would you feel with duetting with him on this thing? And she's like, are you kidding me? So I got a hold of him. He said yes. I asked him, do you think Vernon would drop a solo on it? And he's like, I'm sure he would. Uh, and then they, of course, the way the planets align, all of a sudden they're on tour with Extreme. I had hired Nuno for uh, Rihanna's band for a tour. So Nuno and I were buds. Yeah. I reach out to Nuno. Anyway, long story short, I have this version. I just mixed it yesterday. So the first two solos are oh. Vernon. Uh, it's Corey and Militia singing together. And the last solo is, is Nuno just burning. It's like, it's it's one of these things that you just listen to and go like, oh my God, how did this even happen? It's so cool. It really is cool. Oh. Listen, yeah. Well, th this, is a, this is a good segue to kind of how I wanted to end it because I did want to ask you about when I started this channel and the, the amount of times, cause it, to me, it's a, it's a mesh. It's, it's, it's capturing the session guitarists that no one knew that were such an influence on me. Michael Landau, Dan Huff, Tim Pierce, Steve Lukather. I mean, I'm not saying people don't know who they are. I'm just saying that when they were on a session, no one knew, you know, it's like, I know Jimmy pages and Led Zeppelin, right. but I don't know who played on this share record. That was kick right. ass what you just did. And Michael Landau, you know, has a, uh, you wouldn't know love on, he played it for both Michael Bolton and Cher. He has a burnout on one of those songs that it's starting to fade out. I'm like, where, nope, nope, nope. Yeah. Where are you going? Don't stay there, you know, and that type of thing. But it was also to highlight people like you, Tony, that inspired me to pick up the guitar. And what I think is cool about the full circle moment, and you just brought this up with like having a young person 
connecting it with the living color, connecting this with Nuno, connecting this with extreme is the, the amount of emails that I get since I started this channel or DMS on Instagram or whatever about a kid who's 24, 27, 19, you know, both girls, guys, you name it, who are into this. Like, what is that? What's Soraya? What's danger, danger? What's this? What is, who is Michael Landau? Who's Tony Bruno? Who's Tim Pierce? And it's like I've unlocked something that they didn't even know to search for on Spotify. Right. And now I'm seeing there's kids that are like, whereas like when I used to build tellies, not to say the telly to me is the most insane instrument that was ever created with two pieces of wood that it's still it's my know, desert as island useful guitar. As it was. Desert island guitar. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. If you're going to give me one, just give me that because yeah. I know I can keep it in tune. But there's more kids going, hey, do you have any more super strats available? No, I want the one with the Floyd Rose. No, I don't want. And 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 I. There's so many that are into this melodic period of music from the 80s and the 90s, late 70s, et cetera, kind of the AOR thing, as you say, that it just keeps bubbling up. What do you see from young people? Do you get that same thing? And maybe it's just me. I don't know. But it is off the tr And then I interview people like RJ Ron Kilio and Michael Nielsen and these guys on YouTube that are, hey, this is how an ADA MP1 worked and blah, blah, blah. And it, and it is... I, I see what the rack stuff that I sold for pennies on the dollar in 1996 right. going for like, you know, $900 on reverb. So how do you view the young people looking back on some of this music and how it's influencing maybe music that hasn't come out yet, but will in the next five, 10 years? Um, I think there's some young people like taking shortcuts uh, and, mm. and relying and diving too much into software based, you know, uh, stuff, which is great. Like, I mean, I'm playing my guitar right now through this, you know, uh, Mercurial Euphoria, which is like. That that plug is insane, you know. But yeah, but it's, yeah. but at the end of the day, I think that I think there are a bunch of young people now getting into analog gear, and I think that it, it's really cool that it's become really affordable in in some ways. Yeah, like you can go on Reverb yeah. and get you know really great stuff without spending a ton of money. But I think that I think that the the school of like what you were saying before of of sitting and listening to a record now, it doesn't have to be done anymore. And I feel like mm. I feel like if if I was going to basically have anything to say, you know, to, to what young people need to do is like you have to you have to do the work. Like you, it's okay yeah. to say I'm you know I'm waiting for my big break, but reality is you gotta you kind of have to earn it, you know. And, mm -hmm. and when I say that, I don't mean that, but you have to earn it by being the best. You have to earn it by doing everything you could possibly do, and then mm -hmm. and then you can turn around, you know, and share that with other people. And that's how like that's how the best you know bands. Form. It's like two people or three people who are so driven um, that yeah. they they don't want to take any shortcuts. So I, I yeah. think that I think if if enough you know younger kids and I have a, a young band that I'm working with, they're in their 19s, three girls, and they are just that. You know, they're like they're yeah. not programming yeah. drums. She's playing her ass off, and the uh, the guitar player is crushing, and the bass player is crushing it. I'm like, and they're going to be an inspiration probably to uh, you know. 50 or 60 uh, aspiring musicians their age group just by putting, sure. just by putting stuff on TikTok, you know? Yeah, yeah. It was asking Dan Huff about him, you know, he was <laughs> he was producing, he'll produce guys and they'll be like, hey Dan, you know, play a solo on this or whatever and he'll play, he goes, I think it's really melodic and you know, it's appropriate. And like, no, 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 no. Do the crazy stuff. And it's funny how it's come full circle where that was out of fashion for a while. Right. And now there's kids discovering it and it's coming back. And that's been fun to see, too, for me, especially doing a channel about guitar music. I so think those days been... I think those days need to, to come back. You know, when I listen, when I think back to uh, and I'm not saying long, super long solos on records, because it's like most of the stuff gets played on like, you know, serious now where the songs are like two minutes and 10 seconds. Sure. But uh, but yes, yeah, it's, it's terrible. Uh, but I do think, you know, that for a while people just, you know, surrender the idea of the guitar hero coming back. And I love the fact that Nuno sort of put this thing on the map with this last solo and this last record. It, yeah. I th I'm hoping it made a bunch of kids go back and listen to Satriani and people like that because you yes. know, some of that Satriani stuff is insanely gorgeous. It's yes. not about shredding, you know. No, uh, no. And I yeah. think that there there is there is definitely a, a market for that if if people don't push back on it so much. Yeah. Tony, I got to meet one of my guitar heroes today, man. This uh, whatever happens the rest of the day is it's a bonus. This has been fantastic, <laughs> think, man. This has been so much fun for me too, John. I I just I can't thank you enough, and I'm excited about what you send me. 
I'll I'll send you over uh, the clips of me doing your solo, so you can you can feel free to critique if I messed anything. <laughs> oh, okay, I love that. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. And Tim, yeah. we want that. We want the clip of that. We need to know how that goes. I'm gonna put this all together, and I'll make sure to send it to Tim. And if he has a video response, I'll mash it all up together. That'd be pretty cool. So, oh Tony, thank you, man. I really thank appreciate you, John. it. Much appreciate it.